Good evening. Welcome back to our sessions, if you will, as we discuss God's new people, a theme program that was written in our Formations Study Guide, a study guide that we're using at Second Baptist Church for the month of September. And we are now picking up with week three of that study guide. And this week's lesson is called A Steadfast Shepherd. In Sunday school class today, we talked about a host of things. In Sunday school class, we talked about <clears throat> how difficult it was to navigate 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. We talked about how difficult those verses are. I can only imagine having heard those verses and, and being a non-believer. But someone that does believe, hearing those verses and trying to digest that, in, in particularly in today's world, is difficult. It is very, very difficult. But here we are. We were as a class today, again for those... Uh, who have not been a part of these these discussions or these sessions. This is in reference to the Sunday School class taught at Second Baptist Church from 9.30 in the morning until 10.15. So a 45 minute period of time that we've got to we've got together to, to really kind of digest and, and jump into the word. And just be together. Just be together. So without further ado, let's talk about this particular lesson. Again, a powerful lesson. The light, the light in what is being communicated comes towards the end. But as we start to investigate, and as we investigated that scripture, wow. What a cloud of darkness. What a cloud of darkness. A very, a very hard thing to do. Something that's much easier said than done. But something that can be done and must be done according to Scripture. So let's, let's look at that. What does that look like? So reading from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 17, I'm going to break this down into three, three, three compartments or components, however you'd like to say it. The first set of scripture is four verses, 13 through 17. So I'd like to read that with you right now as we're going. Just follow along on screen and you'll, you're right here where we're at as far as the wording is concerned. But verse 13 says this, For the Lord's sake be subject to every human authority, whether to the emperor as supreme, verse 14 says, or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. Verse 15 goes on to say, For it is God's will that by doing right you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. Verse 16 goes on to say, As servants of God, live as free people. Yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. We wrap that up with verse 17 right now. It says, Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Now, we discussed in class two seminal individuals writing during this time. We brought up first Romans 
Well, we brought up Romans, I should say. But we also talked about Peter. Peter and Paul, Peter and Paul both felt that Christians should honor the institutions of man. Both felt that way. So to kind of, we, we talked about it in class, but to kind of unpack it a little more here, this time when Peter is writing that first century Christian, during that first century, the Roman Empire was dominated by an individual by the name of Nero. And Nero was atrocious. He had this little habit. You can fact check it. Go off and, and do a little research on it, by all means. But he had this habit of rounding up Christians. And he would he would put this liquid on them. In addition to putting liquid on these Christians, he would put them on skewers, impale them, and he would light them on fire. Imagine a scary time for an early Christian. And in Peter's writing, in Peter's writing, it, it says it. For the Lord's sake, be subject to every human authority. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Peter saying this. Now, we talked about it in Sunday school class today. That's got to be difficult, honoring an emperor, knowing that violence is prone to come. You know, another hard part of that is to, to fast forward to the 20th century. Look at some world leaders that were responsible for large amounts of loss of life Adolf Hitler Stalin just some examples again I don't have all the answers but looking at it through that context even from a Christian perspective from a Christian perspective where does forgiveness come in for someone that does something like that. That it's God's will. Turn the other cheek. We have a wonderful example. We talked about that example in Sunday school class today. That wonderful example of who we have to follow. Did it for us. You know, in this particular sequence, between 13 and 17, we talked about something very interesting. If you recall verse 16, it, talked, it used the term freedom. I'll go back and read it again. Verse 16 said this, As servants of God, your freedom, or excuse me, as servants of God, live as free people, yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. As servants of God, live as a free people. You know, that was one of the questions we asked today in class. What does that freedom look like? What does freedom to serve God look like? What does freedom to love God look like? There was a, we had several visitors from the Pelican missions that are here in Memphis, Tennessee, help supporting our church. And we had a young man in that class today who looked and said, the age old saying of, I can go to church on Sunday, but I can mess up during the week, knowing that the following Sunday, all I have to do is ask for forgiveness. 
Never thought of it like that. Is that is that using our, our free our freedom for evil? I don't know. Foolishness? Maybe. I don't know. I'm not the judge. But interesting enough, right? So what is freedom to love God? What does being free mean? Does freedom mean upstanding, or bystanding? One of the terms that I used in class today was a phrase. Knowing something evil is going on and not doing anything about it. What is that? Ignorance is bliss. A state of blissfulness. I don't know. But those first four verses set the agenda for the next three verses 18 through 20 first Peter chapter 2 verses 18 through 20 are probably some of the most difficult verses to really kind of grasp I'm not saying grasp and understanding but just one of those situations where it kind of hits you and you're like wait a minute what does this mean we're gonna get into some, we're gonna get to some historical context on on Peter's writing in a moment but here let's 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 read the scripture first first Peter chapter 2 verses 18 through 20 says this slaves be subject to your masters with all respect not only those who are good and gentle but also those who are dishonest verse 19 says for it is a commendable thing if being aware of God a person endures pain while suffering unjustly if you endure when you are beaten for wrongdoing what credit is that after doing a little research this week I had an opportunity to listen to several podcasts I had an opportunity to listen to a couple of pastors went back through and listened to some sermons come to find out it seems that the old Greek world still had a rather influential persuasion if you will I came across one gentleman who had mentioned that in Peter's time, using Greek, the Greek word for slave would have been servant. Interesting there enough. But let's talk about who populated the area. Roman slavery was atrocious, much like fast forwarding to the 17th, 18th, and 19th century American slave trade. The majority of the people, or a vast number of people, in this region of the world under Roman control would not have been Roman citizens. They would have been servants or slaves or... They wouldn't have been Roman citizens. So life would have been more than difficult. Now granted, the Roman government at times would not have been extraordinarily oppressive but as a society you would have known who was in that particular social class so Peter is writing to these individuals telling them respect the masters listen to the rulers Peter goes on to tell them what's commendable. So these three verses, these three verses make way for 
for the light switch. These three verses pave the way for the example. The example for what we are supposed to, to follow. In the next five verses, that middle room lit up. Stories started to come out. People started to share experiences. People started to share what they've lived, how they interact with others, what they think about. It was a completely vulnerable time for a lot of people, including myself. We were in it together. But moving forward with 1 Peter chapter 2, 21 through 25. 21 says this. Follow along with me on screen. It says, For to this you have been called. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his footsteps. 22 then says, He committed no sin, and no deceit was found in his mouth. 23 goes on to say, When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that having died to sins, he might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were going astray like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. What a wonderful experience today in that middle room at Second Baptist Church. talking about a very uncomfortable a very uncomfortable scripture lesson one which we can specifically relate to as we see the political arena play out among us all here in the United States we see it play out Going back in that scripture, being told, getting an example, seeing that example unfold in scripture of how we should act, how we should pray for our leaders, again difficult. Politics are everywhere right now. But getting back to chapter 2, verses 13 through 25, and just realizing that there's something more than, than us, there's something more than us. Here we are, you may be listening to this. We have, we are that faith follower. And we try to emulate the behavior of, of Christ our Savior. And I think that, I think that this type of lesson really puts things into perspective. Maybe not even perspective. But it gets things back to a, A way of of being I'll be the first one to tell you that I overthink overthink things 
I overanalyze it. I overanalyze it till it's overanalyzed and beyond analyzing any longer. And I still overanalyze that. I used an example of my I used an example of my college classes. The example was that when I assign a paper, provide an example. How simple that when you're reading through those last five verses. Peter is assigning us an assignment. And that assignment is the example to follow on the assignment is Christ. How powerful. You know, I can't I can't put in these these videos the feeling that one has when we're in that middle room together on a Sunday. I can't do it. You won't see it on the video. But if you're ever in Memphis, Tennessee, and you're ever around Second Baptist Church, and you ever want to come and hear our wonderful pastor, Stephen Cook, I encourage you to do so. Those doors are always open. If you're ever in the Memphis area and you ever want to stop by that middle room, or for any for any Sunday school for that matter, any Sunday school, you're always welcome. We've got a host of classes that are going on right now. We've got wonderful teachers, ready, willing, and able to share their experiences, to share their lives with you through teaching. So come on down if you're ready. Until then, I hope you found some comfort in the scripture reading for A Steadfast Shepherd. Again, this is a publication from Smith and Helwes. It is from our, from our formation study guide that we're using for this particular, this quarter, I should say, that goes from September to December. But this one month we're reading from out of the book of Peter. I hope you all have a wonderful week. And we will see you soon. Bye.